Good morning. Good morning. People are still gathering. It's good to see. It's good to see so many friends and family, especially of Willie Dragstra, as we celebrate his 75th birthday. It's celebrated this past week. There'll be an open house this morning after our church service in the basement, and you're all here for that, I'm sure, and that's wonderful. Uh, to all of our guests this morning, welcome. Welcome if you're joining by means of video. May God bless us as we worship him together today. In our study of scripture, we're continuing to work through the Gospel of John, the portion where Jesus addresses his disciples just before he's betrayed and crucified. And Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John about the gift, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to take up a, a bit of that teaching this morning from our Savior Jesus. It will have to do with persecution. It will have to do with what it means to live as a child of God in this world as we look for the world to come. And so with that in mind, what it means to live in this world, let's listen to this portion of 1 Peter chapter 5 as our call to worship. Be alert and of sober mind your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With that promise of help from God, let's turn our hearts to God in silent prayer and ask him to prepare us for this worship service. is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Grace and peace to you. From God the Father, through the mercy of Jesus Christ our Savior, and through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And to this let the children of God say, Amen. Let's welcome one another as the family of God. We stand together singing our praises to God.
standing together, we confess our faith, answering this question from the Heidelberg Catechism, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And this question, what must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sins and misery. Third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. Please be seated. Did you know that there is someone who takes attendance of Lebanon Church every Sunday? He's not here himself. He's watching the video that uh, is broadcast on the cable channel in, in Sioux Center. And he's not very happy if during the offertory the camera isn't scanning the pews. So I'm wondering this morning, Willie Dragstra, are you taking attendance? <laughs> you can see the whole crowd. You, hey, you've got a perfect view. Because I notice you're exactly under the camera this morning. So the only one that they're not going to see is you. What a wonderful blessing God has given us this morning that you, Willie, are able to be here once again joining us for worship here in Lebanon and to be able to celebrate uh, your milestone this past week of 75 years 
that God has given you in this world as he's preparing you for the world to come as he prepares us all. But to be able to mark this milestone and to be gathered around by so many friends and family this morning, God bless you, Willie. We're so, so thrilled to be able to share this day with you and, uh, and to share the meal afterwards. So happy birthday, Willie. We wish you a happy birthday together. We'll sing happy birthday downstairs. <laughs> and Monty and Shelley, I don't want to embarrass you noticing that you're here with us this morning, but our dear neighbors, my dear friend, first of all, my dad would say hello, Monty. But they're both truckers. They're both retired truckers. So we have uh, things to talk about. Monty, you're here this morning following yet another surgery a couple weeks ago. And we, we pray for you. We, we uh, remember you. Uh, we love you both. And we're grateful that this is a day that uh, you can join us as well. So just be assured of, of our love for you. And uh, it's just good to see you. Just wanted to say hello. During this past week, we've been praying for Tony Bonama. Uh, Tony this past week underwent um, a second procedure, a uh, more extensive procedure to repair, actually now to replace the mitral valve in his heart, one of his four major heart valves that we all have. Um, and also to receive a couple of bypasses. That surgery was on Friday. Tony now is under light sedation, and he's, they're, they're hoping to get him to respond to simple commands, and he has yet to respond. Um, they're expecting that uh, there's going to be a brain scan soon to see if there's any issues there, hopefully to rule out any issues there, but uh, we should continue to pray for Tony and Sue and for the rest of the family. Uh, this has been a long haul for Tony already in the hospital in Sioux Falls. Uh, we've been alerted last week to Pete Haberhals, not you Pete Haberhals, but to your uncle, right? That would be your uncle Pete in Seattle, do I remember correctly? And last week, or a little more than a week ago, I uh, was told that he had stage four pancreatic cancer. We'll continue to pray for him. Does anybody have any update on his condition? No, I don't think it's pancreatic anymore. It's liver not pancreatic, but perhaps liver cancer. So more tests and to... So they're going to start treatments with a port. We'll, we'll learn more, of course, as, as things progress there, but uh, we will continue to pray for um, Pete Haverhalls in Seattle. Emmett Haverhalls is home, and that's encouraging news. What a journey that little guy has had. And uh, we continue to pray for Emmett and for Mark and Molly and Clara and Robert and Val for you too as well as you continue to walk this journey. Are there any other prayer requests that we should include this morning in our prayers? Yeah, here. Uh, just in regard to all the people you just mentioned, uh, I know on Molly's caring period she was stating about the care that they get from the doctors and the nurses and also the doctors trying to make sure that they're addressing his issues correctly and that goes for all the other patients that you know, we should be thankful for the doctors and nurses. But, you know, they really carry the heavy load for they're trying to help people along so. That's a very thoughtful thing for us to remember this morning. The load of responsibility that, that doctors and nurses and their, their team carry as they care for those who have great and uh, sometimes very anxious needs. So we'll pray for them this morning. Thank you.
Let's pray together. What a beautiful gift you've given us this morning, Father. A day that has greeted us with blue skies and sunshine and warmth. A pleasant day for us to enjoy. This is a gift from you, and we're grateful for that. We're grateful, Lord, to see the world around us, the fields around us, responding to the blessings and the provision that have come from your hand. And Lord, even though sometimes that provision has come with challenges of flood, wind damage for some, still, Father, we see so much of your faithfulness in, in what we see growing and greening around us. We're grateful for that. We're grateful, too, for the, the work that you do within us, within our hearts. Because, Father, through your provision of a son, we have received a savior, salvation, forgiveness, eternal life, and a new call to obedience. And Father, we ask that as the world responds to your moisture and warmth, that you would help each of us in our hearts to respond to the gift of your Holy Spirit and to your word. Help us, Lord, to find comfort in the knowledge that we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, give us power and word to share that good news with the world around us. Sometimes it's difficult, Lord, to find the words that we want to have to be able to share that, that call to faith in Jesus and that promise of eternal life and a new creation. Give us the words when our words fail us, Lord. Give us opportunities to share your good news. We pray this morning for those who partner with us to share that news around the world. We think this morning of Steve and Tara, of their Bible studies and of their training that they give to send others into many parts of the world, equipped to bring the love and grace of Jesus Christ to their own people. Be with Steve and Tara and support and provide for them, we pray. And Lord, this morning we pray for Sos and Kara and their work in Guinea, in West Africa, and throughout the continent of Africa. Bless the offerings that we give for their support this morning, and we pray, Lord, that you would encourage them in their work and bless them in the establishment and growth of Christian education through the teacher's garden. And bless also, we pray, our support of another missionary on the continent of Africa, in South Africa, with class of Sayakota. Lord, we support Tyler and Christina Helfers. And we pray that you would bless and encourage them in their missionary work today. We pray, Lord, for those churches who are seeking pastors. That can be sometimes discouraging and difficult work, Lord. Congregations, perhaps, who wonder what the future holds for them as they, as they search for pastoral leadership. And so this morning we lift to you our neighboring churches, Haywarden Church, an Inwood Church, and New Holland Church, and their search for pastoral leadership. We also pray, Lord, that you would bless those who are studying and preparing for ministry, those who anticipate being declared candidates for ministry, and those, Lord, whom you will be calling to pursue preparation for ministry. We pray, Lord, for a sufficient number of leaders to equip and build and send your church to do its task. With the churches of Sioux Center, we 
lift to you today the Church of God congregation and the ministry of Dustin Bulks. Father, on this day, we give you thanks for prayers you answered in the past and for the occasion you give us today as we celebrate the birthday of our brother in Christ, Willie Dragstra. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity for him to be gathered around by friends and family and the family of God in this place to celebrate that milestone you've given to him. We thank you too for Monty and Shelley here with us today and continue Lord to hear and answer our prayers for Monty's recovery. And we thank you that you have brought him so far. Continue Lord to bless and provide for them. We lift Tony Bonama to you today and the Bonama family as they anxiously await news of his condition and look for signs of healing and progress, Lord, we commend him to you, knowing that with you all things are possible, and only from you can the blessing of recovery, healing, and wholeness be found. Hear our prayers for his healing. We pray that you would be with Pete Haverhals in Seattle, and bless him as he prepares to receive therapy, chemotherapy for his cancer. Continue to be with Emmett Haverhalls and Mark and Molly and Clara and the entire family as they walk a long journey. We pray that you would provide opportunities for a better future for Dante Golker. That you would remember Greta Croyd as she and Willie together receive care at Crown Point. We lift Cole and Shelby to you today and we ask that you would prepare them for the marriage vows that they look forward to exchanging next month. We pray that you would be with our young people who are young adults now and and have found work and a life beyond this congregation now, but Lord, they're still dear to us and dear to you. Be with Tyler Steenhook, with Eli Dunn, Tyler Dunn, and Jace Noyes. Bless and keep them, and Lord, help them to find a place among your people and a way to continue to build their faith. Father, all of these things and more, we always lift to you in the name of Jesus, the only way to prayer and to your blessing. In his name, amen. Our offerings this morning for Sol and Kara and for the Hope Food Pantry.
stand to sing as we prepare to hear God's word today. in your Bibles with me if you use a Bible in the pew this morning to page 1001. Page 1001 and you will find John 15 reading John 15 verse 18 through 16 verse 4 this morning. Last week we heard Jesus' word, I am the vine and you are the branches and we remembered last week that we are not simply dead branches in Christ, nor are we simply vain blossoms that flow from the life of Christ, but we bear fruit for Christ. And that fruit that we bear in Christ, he is the vine, we are the branches, that fruit is love. So the strong theme from verse 1 through 17 in John 15 is bearing the fruit of love and now in verse 18 Jesus pivots on his heel he was talking about love he's talking about hate there's a contrast here and he's talking about what it means what it will be like for the fruit bearing branches to live in a world like this, living in the middle of this world. The Bibles are open. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, who inspired this word, who carries to us the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, now we pray that you would open our hearts, ears, and minds to receive this word with understanding and with faith. Amen. John 15, verse 18. By the way, notice verse 17. This is my command, love each other. Jesus pivots on his heel. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, you would love, it would love you as its own, as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words that I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will, also, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they would obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles 
and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you, so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. But I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Verses 18 and 19 to begin again this morning, people of God. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. People of God, Jesus reveals a distinction here. He's talking about the world, and he's talking about belonging to him. He's talking about those who belong to the world and those who belong to him. And notice, first of all, as Jesus is speaking to his church, to his disciples, and to those who follow to us today, how it is that we come to belong to Jesus. Jesus does not say, you know, I looked around the world and I saw what a mess it was, and Jesus does talk pretty soon about the extent of the mess of the world. But he does not say, you know, I I looked at the mess of the world, but then I found these, these shining little jewels, these special little people, and I picked them out of the muck and the mud that the world is. I saw these shiny little diamonds, and I thought, I will put those in my pocket. Because they are special. That is not what Jesus says. That is not what Jesus says about us, and that is never how we should think about ourselves if we are children of God. What does Jesus say? I have chosen you out of the world. Jesus is saying to us, remember how you started. You were no different. You were not special. You belonged to this world that I'm going to tell you about here pretty soon, the world that hates God and will hate you. We were no different when we began. We had no natural love for God in our hearts, no natural desire to enter his kingdom. The way that it happens is not that we come to Jesus, but that Jesus comes to us. And this is what the power of Jesus is able to do, is to take the sort of people that Christians used to be, who were no different than anyone else of the human race, and Jesus is able to take them and to save them, to make them new. We don't turn ourselves into Christians. What it means to be saved by Jesus Christ is much more than just having our sins forgiven. You know what, I commit sins and Jesus died for my sins, and so that 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 punishment that my sin deserves is the punishment that falls on him and not on me, and so I'm saved. So my sins are forgiven. But there's more to it than that. 
To be saved means to be claimed as a child of God. It means more than being forgiven. It means that we are changed. That Jesus changes us. That the choosing of Jesus is the cleansing of Jesus. And that's who we become when we are in Jesus Christ. It's a gift. It's a work of Jesus in our hearts. Now, Jesus says, when this happens, when I call you to be and claim you to be as my own, that doesn't mean immediately you get to go to heaven and escape this world. It doesn't mean that you're going to find little pockets of shelter and safety in this world, that I'm going to, to hide you away somewhere where nobody else can find you, where, where, where you won't be bothered by anybody else that, that doesn't care for me. Jesus says, I've chosen you, but I've chosen you to do the very thing that God the Father sent me, Jesus, to do as your Savior, and that thing is this, to live in the middle of a world like this. What sort of world is this? Verse 20. If you have your Bibles open, that was page 1001. Verse 20. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. But they will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles. And yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. Jesus is talking about persecution. He's talking about what it's like to live as a representative of the holiness of God's kingdom in the middle of this sort of world. This is what Jesus says about this world. First of all, this world loves the things that God can do. It does. This world of sin still loves the things that God can do. How many people were chasing after Jesus to get their share of the miracles that Jesus was doing? They love the things that God can do. We want doctors to heal our diseases, but when doctors run out of answers and options and there's nowhere else to turn, we go to Jesus because we love the things that God can do. The world chased after Jesus for his miracles. But they did not chase after the God who could do those miracles. They loved the blessings. They didn't love the God who gave the blessings. Why is that? Well, Maybe it's because we don't like to be told what to do. Do you like to be told what to do? Jesus went around telling people what to do. Mostly he went to religious leaders of his day and pointed out their hypocrisy. But he went around telling people what to do. You have heard it said, 
Jesus said. Love your friends and hate your enemies. But I tell you, you should love your enemies. We don't want to hear Jesus telling us what to do. We can put names to our enemies. Love your enemies? Jesus said, you should love people more than you love your money, and you should love God above all. Well, we don't want a Jesus to tell us not to love and to keep our money, but to be generous with our money and to share it, to be concerned about people who don't have enough. We don't want people telling us what to do. Jesus said, you've heard, don't commit adultery, but I say to you, you look on anyone with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. We don't want Jesus telling us what to do, how our relationships need to be shaped and defined and guarded and transformed. We don't want Jesus telling us what to do. The world loved the miracles. The world hated the law. And that's what we do by nature. And Jesus said, when they hated me, they hated the Father who sent me. Because they don't want this way of holiness. The reason that you're listening to me as one of my disciples, says Jesus, is because I've called you, I've chosen you, I've made you new. And you're welcoming my word, and, and you're wanting to walk with me, but that shows that, that I've changed you, that, that you're converted, that you're different. But now I'm going to leave you in this sort of world. And the world that resents what I have to say is going to be the world that's going to resent what you have to say. They're going to resist you. They're going to persecute you. Not only because of who you are, but because of who your God is. This world, as a whole, is not friendly space to holiness. It's not. And yet Jesus leaves us here in the middle of this sort of world. Why? Why? Let's read more. John 15, verse 26 through 16, verse 4. When the counselor comes... Now Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. When the counselor comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth that goes out from my Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. It will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this, so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first, because I was with you. When the counselor comes. What Jesus is doing in his ministry is preparing his people and preparing a way for the Holy Spirit to enter this world. And the way that the Holy Spirit of God enters this world is not just to show up that, that God is out there somewhere in, in a place that we can go in the middle of a wilderness to find this fire, this flame of God burning, and we can make a pilgrimage there. That's not where God comes. That's not where God lives. You know where God lives in this world, don't you? 
Do you know where God lives in this world? In his people. In the children of God. This is where God lives in this world. Why? For the same reason that God was in, in, in the Son of God and Jesus was in this world. To reveal God. To tell the truth about God. He's the spirit of truth. To make God known. That's what this testimony is about. That's what this witness is about. We are here when the Holy Spirit fills us to make God known in this sort of world. Why? When we hear Jesus talking about the world here, do you get the idea that, that uh, not only the world hates Jesus, but that Jesus doesn't think much of the world either? Do you get that idea that, well, the, the feeling is mutual? The world hates God and the things of God and the, I guess the people of God, right? And so God looks at this world and he doesn't think much of this world either. He doesn't think much of, of people who only want his miracles but don't want him. God doesn't think much of this world. You get that idea? That's not the whole story. That's not even the best part of the story. Because this Jesus, who's talking about this world that is constantly resisting and pushing back against God is the same Jesus who's revealing the God of John, same gospel, John 3, 16 and 17. What does Jesus say about the world? What does the Father say about the world? This is the world that hates him Come on, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. It is not the job of the church to go into the world to condemn it. It is not the job of, of the church to go into the world and to say to the world, you are hopeless. It is not the job of the, world, of the church to go into the world and to tell the world, God has given up on you because you gave up on God. Is the world sinful? Absolutely. Are there things wrong about the world? Of course. But what should we expect? It's a world without God. Of course there's going to be all kinds of examples of people who are living in sin. But that's not the story that God gives us. Remember when Jesus came into this sort of world, he came with the message of the grace and the mercy, the forgiveness and the love of God. That same message, that same presence of God in such a world as this 
now comes into the world by the church through the Holy Spirit. The world might not like what it hears. The world will not like those who bring that word consistently. But look what happened. When Jesus came to call and choose and gather his church, they came out of the world and into the kingdom. That same thing, Jesus says, that same thing will still happen today. Because the Spirit is here. Because the church is here, living in the middle. Not letting persecution stop it. Not letting persecution silence the message. And it's a message of love. It's a message of grace. It's a message of life. Or a world that's dying. Jesus entrusts his good news to his church to save this world from itself in spite of the hatred that the world has for God God still chooses to love the people that he's calling from this world. Let's pray. First of all, Lord Jesus, we confess to you that we are not often enough or passionate enough faithful in keeping this charge that you've given to us and in using and living out of the power of your Holy Spirit to live in the middle of this sort of world. We do see things in this world, Lord, that are worthy of condemnation. There's no doubt about that. This world is a mess. But it's the sort of mess that Jesus came to redeem. Father, through him, you are calling people from this world to your kingdom. We pray today that you would build your church and that you would help us to be faithful servants of that testimony in word and deed to bring the goodness and hope of Jesus Christ to a world that's dying. Help us to love the work that you love to do. And Lord, we ask for your blessing upon that work that the people near to us and the people far from us, by your grace, may be open and tender to respond to that good news. For your glory. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
go with the Spirit and the Word of God into this world to love and serve Him. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen.